Today we're going to look at artists' engagement with the outdoors in urban landscapes or cityscapes and in rural scenes. The focus is on works international and Irish held by the Hugh Lane Gallery, which hopefully you'll have an opportunity to see in person. The Hugh Lane Gallery was established by Hugh Lane, first opening in 1908 as a gallery of modern art. Lane's intention was to collect and exhibit works from the mid 19th century, the period generally accepted as that in which modern art began. The words modern, modernity, modernism, of course, always caused debate. But Edward Manet, uh, whose dates are 1832 to 1883, is a key figure in modern art. This painting, Music in the Tuileries Gardens, has been described as a declaration or a manifesto of modernity because of its subject matter, which is urban leisure, and the way in which it's painted with visible brushwork, flattened figures, no clear focus on any one group, cropped figures on the left and on the right, patches and daubs of paint making up much of the scene. Manet spent many hours in the Tuileries Gardens observing, drawing and sketching, but of course the work was painted in his studio. The painting is part of the original Hugh Lane uh, collection. It's a large and imposing work on which we could spend hours, but of course we can't do that today. However, it is a pivotal work. Lane, of course, never intended that the collection would stagnate, but that it would continue to expand as time went on, as indeed it has. So currently, the artworks range from the mid 19th century, some are a little bit earlier than Manet's, to the present. There is, of course, a, a long tradition of artists in Western art engaging with the outdoors, and there are numerous examples of cityscapes and more rural landscapes by Irish and international artists in Irish collections and, of course, elsewhere. I thought perhaps we would start by looking at some earlier cityscapes and rural landscapes, beginning with William van der Hagen's view of Waterford from 1736. This is the earliest commissioned view of a city in Ireland, and it was commissioned by Waterford Cor Corporation and begun by van der Hagen in 1735. The painting is eight feet in width and wasn't painted in en plein air. However, van der Hagen positioned himself on Misery Hill on the opposite side of the River Shore and did preparatory drawings uh, outdoors, which he later translated into the finished work. The river frontage along the quays is quite accurate, but he has used artistic license in, the, uh, in his painting of the hills behind. Van der Hagen also painted um, capriccios or imaginary uh, landscapes. He was a Dutch artist who came to live in Ireland. His view of Drogheda, painted in 1718, is his earliest Irish uh, urban landscape. And this is the painting as it hangs in the drawing room of the Bishop's Palace in Waterford. Almost 300 years later, in 2016, Blaise Smith was commissioned to paint Waterford from the same spot on Misery Hill as van der Hagen had done. Smith's work is five metres in width. His intention is to document and provide a record for the future, so the work will grow in importance over time. It is five metres wide and painted on 52 gesso panels. He says that panels make the work durable and references Holbein's work. So, for example, a, a work like Holbein's The Ambassadors from the 1530s in the National Gallery in London is oil on oak. This is a detail from that very large work. And of course, you can see Shaw's department store there on the quays. One of the most important artists who engaged with the outdoors and cityscapes and urban landscapes was Giovanni Canaletto, whose dates are 1697 to 1768. He was born in Venice. Canaletto is renowned for his vedute or topographical paintings with architectural detail. And this canvas, uh, quite, a, quite an early work, 1723 to 24, already features some of the most notable characteristics of his style. These include the choice of a high viewpoint to create the composition, 
the precision with which the buildings are depicted with all of their ornamental details, and the depiction of numerous elements that create the overall atmosphere of the work. As you can see, the rendering of the buildings on the right and the left allow a depth of perspective, and the verticality of the campanile is a dramatic contrast to the horizontal undulating line of St. Mark's Basilica, and then you can see the Doge's Palace just in the right-hand corner. Canaletto's paintings can often be dated by the accuracy of detail, and this is an example of one such work. The paving on the left and the right was part of a project undertaken between 1723 and 1734. And the phase represented in this painting, that is, with the central area not newly paved, can be dated to 1723 to 24. Canaletto's paintings were frequently produced or purchased by young men on the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour was part of the education of wealthy and or titled young men, mainly from Britain and, and from Ireland, who travelled to uh, Italy in particular to complete their education. And the 18th century, of course, was the high point uh, of the Grand Tour. It coincided with the excavations of Herculaneum and Pompeii, which began in the 1730s and 40s, and with the writings of Johann Winkelmann on the classical period of ancient Greece and Rome. And all of this interest in classicism led to neoclassicism. And of course, one of the greatest contributors to the neoclassical movement in Ireland was James Caulfield, first Earl of Charlemont, who built the wonderful house, Charlemont House, which is now the Hugh Lane Gallery. And he also built the casino at Marino, considered to be the most perfect example of a neoclassical building on the islands of Ireland or Britain. And this is the lovely casino at Marino, as painted by Thomas Roberts. Thomas Roberts was born in Waterford. His dates are 1746 to only uh, 1777. He is considered to be Ireland's greatest landscape painter. Here we have another wonderful landscape by Thomas Roberts, uh, this time one that is more in the Claudian style. The Claudian landscape is named for Claude Lorraine, the French artist whose dates are 1600 to 1682. So some of the typical devices would be, as we see here, a river leading the eye into the far distance towards the hills along the horizon. Uh, there are also figures on the uh, walking along the bank of the river. Uh, again, this is uh, an element of the Claudian landscape, uh, adding narrative to the scene. Moving forward into the 19th century, with regard to documentation, George Petrie was a hugely important figure in Irish culture. His dates are 1790 to 1866. He was an antiquarian, an ethnographer, an archaeologist, a historian, as well as an artist. And the purpose of his work is documentation and preservation. He travelled around Dublin from 1808 and into the neighbouring counties, making drawings and documenting monuments and ruins. And then later on, he began to go to the west of Ireland and other areas of Ireland. He was a Protestant and he was the son of an artist. Uh, he believed that people from his background, his friends and colleagues, did not understand Irish culture, and that that uh, was also the case for the upper classes. In his view, uh, dissemination of knowledge with regard to Ireland's rich her heritage would uh, improve understanding and respect for Ireland's people and culture. Uh, his work also had a political dimension in that he thought that uh, enlightenment with regard to these matters would also uh, uh, encourage Britain to address what he described as wrongdoings of the past. So he was really central to the development of Irish studies in the 19th century. Delicacy and precision are features of Petrie's work. And this depiction of Christchurch Cathedral is as it was prior to the construction carried out later in the 19th century. 
So um, that is just some of the background, but by no means exhaustive into uh, artists' engagement with the outdoors in earlier uh, times. So moving back uh, to the collection at the Hugh Lane Gallery, this work by Corot is an, an early painting in the collection. Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot was born in Paris in 1796. In 1825, Corot traveled to Italy and he was there for about three years. He painted several works inspired by Rome and the surrounding countryside. This is not an exact view. He has used artistic license and somewhat idealized it. Corot depicts the fountain basin, as you can see, in the immediate foreground, uh, with the cupola of St. Peter's behind. But in fact, it's not possible to see this particular view from, the vantage, from his vantage point. And the view is framed by these very, very dark trees uh, on either side of the uh, basin and then light emanates from the centre. The painting is regarded as a masterpiece, uh, justifiably, and it was one of those bought from the collection of James Stat Forbes. The campaign for its purchase uh, was led by Rose Barton, who was herself a significant artist of cityscapes, particularly Dublin. And this is Rose Barton's beautiful watercolour of Lindsay House from the River, Lindsay House was Hugh Lane's London home, so it's nice to, to have this uh, work in the collection. Moving forward to later in the 19th century, artists formed colonies in places like Brittany and in Barbizon and grace loire villages in the forest around Fontainebleau. The Barbizon group, among whom were Jean-Francois Millet and Theodore Rousseau, rejected earlier movements like neoclassicism and romanticism and moved towards naturalistic depictions and painting uh, outdoors, uh, plein air painting. Their subjects were the quotidian and they favoured earthy colours and richly contrasting tones. Frank O'Mara was an Irish artist. He was born in Carlo and spent some time in the studios of uh, Carlos Duran in Paris before moving to Grey sur Loire. The solitary figure depicted here is typical of O'Mara's work. The old woman is burning autumn leaves, reference, referencing the season and her advanced years. The work would not actually have been painted outdoors. A study for the painting is also part of the Hugh Lane collection. And in that particular case, uh, the study is quite large and uh, quite finished. So uh, it too was probably painted in the studio, but Omaro would have done quite a lot of the preparation work outdoors. He would have um, been very familiar with the, uh, with the River Loire uh, as it flows through Grace Your Loire and he would also have uh, sketched outdoors. These works uh, may, see, may seem less stylized than, for example, the Thomas Roberts uh, landscapes that we were looking at uh, just a moment ago, but they are, but they are not uh, spontaneous. As you can see from uh, this lovely uh, charcoal and pencil drawing on the key etapel from 1888, uh, you can see the similarity <clears throat> between the two um, women here. The, the old woman uh, seems to have modelled for both paintings. So uh, given that the um, villages are quite a distance from one another, um, it, you know, it, it's clear that uh, Omara was using a model. There's also a, a, an astonishing similarity between the profile of the young child in this, this young girl, and uh, Omara's fiance, who was, of course, a slightly older woman in her 20s and 30s. But there is a, a strong similarity between the, between the two women. Meantime, of course, <clears throat> other changes were already happening in France. This is Manet's Lavacor under snow uh, from 1881. Manet, whose dates are 1840 to 1927, had been encouraged by his teacher, Eugene Baudin, to paint out of doors. Things like portable easels, uh, small tubes of paint, the expansion of the railways, the invention of the bicycle, all contributed to the ease with which artists could engage in painting on plein air. 
And of course, they had easy access to subjects because other people could also more easily take trips to lakes and parks and beaches and so forth. Artists painting on plein air uh, quickly captured moments, uh, changing light, movement, the transitory. The palette was often lighter, brush strokes were looser and artists captured the impression. Here, Monet is focusing on the effect of light on snow. The vantage point is low, so we are looking up at the scene. To the right of the canvas, uh, we can see a house and some outhouses or sheds loosely painted to give the impression of stone. From the buildings and the row of trees in front of them, the snow covered ground slopes down to the river, which is really only uh, indicated by a few brush strokes, uh, which indicate the little boat. Other than these elements, the buildings, the trees and the boat, the remainder of the canvas is ostensibly white. Although in reality, Monet has used several colours to indicate white snow, uh, to indicate a winter sky and the river in winter. In the foreground, light blue and uh, little hints of um, uh, grey give way uh, as you move up towards the trees and the house to uh, darker brush strokes in a sort of darker violet blue. The bank of the river too, particularly in the bottom left corner, is roughly indicated with deeper blue, as is the horizon line um, of, the, of the hills. And this deeper blue, uh, apart from the shadow of the trees and the house, uh, it is probably the reflection of the darker cloud towards the centre of the sky. Whereas when the, when the sky lightens, uh, particularly on the left of the painting, that is reflected with the lighter tones of uh, uh, pinks and pale blues and uh, pale greys on, on the hills. Monet painted several series. He painted poplars, haystacks, and 95 paintings of the River Thames. These were grouped as the Waterloo Bridge paintings, Charing Cross Bridge paintings, and the Houses of Parliament and he did 41 uh, paintings of Waterloo Bridge. This one here is an early morning scene. The vehicles crossing the bridge are indicated with little strokes of red to indicate lights. And of course, uh, we see the smoke billowing from factory chimneys and the morning sky with touches of pink cloud. The water is indicated by the strokes which uh, show the current. And here there are greens and pinks uh, in the water, as well as grey and blue tones. When painting a series, Monet often worked on several canvases, moving from one to the other as the light changed throughout the day, or if he was working on them over several seasons, uh, he would uh, change, he would move from one canvas to the other as the season changed. Monet, one of Monet's contemporaries was, of course, uh, Pierre Auguste Renoir, uh, whose dates are 1841 to 1919. And this is Les Parapluies from 1886. Monet and Renoir um, often worked uh, together on occasion side by side, as when uh, they painted the same subject at La Grenouillere in 1869. And of course, they exhibited together. Le Parapluie, however, differs somewhat from some other works by Renoir. The population of Paris doubled between 1850 and 1870. The influx of people from rural areas uh, brought men without social or familial ties and young women looking for, for work. And uh, one of the uh, problems about this period was the definition of um, uh, prostitution and the blurring of lines. So there were several different uh, categories, including uh, young women who worked as seamstresses or who worked in department stores or as housemaids. And this uh, young woman on the left uh, is likely working as a part-time uh, prostitute. The, this painting is uh, really interesting because it, it, um, it records a change in uh, Renoir's uh, relationship with Impressionism. 
uh, he, in 1881, he began this painting, but uh, in that year, he visited Italy. And in 1884, he, he broke with Impressionism and went back to Lyme. So uh, that's what, you know, becomes so fascinating about this work. Uh, when he began the work in 1881, uh, research into the clothing by the mother, the uh, woman on the right with the uh, fur cloak, uh, and her two daughters show that their, their clothing was the height of fashion in 1881. The uh, clothes worn by the older girl uh, 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 could be seen in uh, fashion magazines of that year. And fashion was again used to help the date the change uh, to date the changes made by Renoir in 1885 and 1886. So uh, the young woman on the left, uh, who is lifting her skirt, uh, originally she was wearing a belt and she had a hat and she was uh, had some flowers in her basket and so on. But uh, when uh, Renoir uh, broke with Impressionism at that period. He painted uh, and returned to line. She became a much more distinct figure uh, in the painting. The gesture of lifting her skirt uh, indicates that she uh, is possibly making herself available as a prostitute. And the uh, way that the man standing behind her is looking at her suggests that this is what is happening. But it is in Renoir's return to line that uh, we can see the pathos in the face of the of the young girl. And of course, it is an expression that remains with us. So although the work ostensibly captures a moment on a rainy day in Paris, as people hold their umbrellas aloft and a young, young woman raises her skirt to step over a puddle, it can also uh, indicate much more and the painting has a historical and sociological aspect. This work here uh, by Bert Morisot is quint quintessentially um, Impressionist. This is Jure from 1879, and it is also in the collection of Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane. Morisot, whose dates were 1841 to 1895, exhibited with the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874 and in most subsequent ones. She continued to paint after her marriage to Manet's brother in 1874. And uh, this beautiful sun-filled work is very much of, that, of the, the Impressionist movement. She uses swift brush strokes in every direction, which gives uh, a light, radiant quality to her work. Uh, and that's particularly obvious in the water uh, visible just behind uh, and between the two figures. The Impressionists frequently portrayed leisure uh, or small family groups in an intimate setting, doing such things as you know, gardening, walking, sewing, boating. Morisot's subjects were considered suitable for a woman, uh, uh, suitable for a woman artist and suitable for a woman of her class. But in fact, uh, they're really very much in line with uh, Impressionist subjects, uh, whether painted by male or female artists. And to move back to uh, Ireland and uh, some of the artists who were influenced by the movements going on uh, in, on the continent. This is Walter Osborne's uh, Tea in the Garden from 1902. Osborne was born in Dublin in 1859 and he died in 1903. He initially trained at the Royal Hibernian Academy School in Dublin and he also attended classes in the Metropolitan School. Um, he went to st study in the Academy des Beaux-Arts in Antwerp and then in 1883 he moved to Brittany where the artist colonies were influenced by Jules Bastien Lepage and naturalism. Osborne was also influenced by Impressionism, and his depiction of afternoon tea in the garden is in impression, Impressionistic in style and subject matter. The setting is the garden of Osborne's neighbours, the Crawford, and the young woman, Miss Crawford, pours tea attended by her maid. The uh, artist's niece uh, uh, sits on the grass with another child, and a sketchy, unfinished elderly figure 
who appears to sit behind them dressed in black. It uh, looks as though she may be uh, reading uh, for the children. This work is uh, really beautifully painted and um, Osborne captures the light coming through the, um, the leaves of the trees. So we have this lovely dappled light which falls onto the cheek of the young woman as she pours the tea and down onto the sleeve of her blouse and uh, onto the tablecloth. Um, capturing the, the, um, the light at particular times of day and drawing on this intimate scene is very uh, typical of Impressionism. And moving on to uh, William Orpen and A Breezy Day Hoax from 1909. Orpen too was born in Dublin in 1878. And uh, in a series of paintings, uh, generally called the Hoax paintings, he uh, engages with Impressionism. And these works are very, very distinctive within his oeuvre, which was very varied in any case. So uh, here uh, we have the young woman uh, whose hair seems to be blowing in the in the breeze uh, on Ho's head. Uh, it's actually his wife, Grace, and he depicted her over and over again in the Holt painting. Here, her figure is very loosely painted, so he is very much following uh, Impressionism in this. Uh, and also, the, in the painting of the Heather and Gorse in the, in the foreground, again, just sort of dabs of paint to indicate the heather and the gorse. Although if you have an opportunity to look at the painting very closely, in fact, it's quite carefully underdrawn. However, when Orphan tackles the sea and the, um, the landscape on the far side of Dublin Bay, the Sugarloaf Mountain and the far shore, these elements are quite precise and they're very finely painted. So while he engages with Impressionism to a certain extent, uh, he never uh, becomes fully committed to it. And moving back to uh, Osborne briefly, we, uh, we really can't look at urban images within Irish art without uh, looking at Osborne's uh, street scenes, his Dublin street scenes in particular. Catherine Milligan notes that Osborne's depictions of Dublin are, quote, arguably the most important collection of works showing the changing city from the 1880s to the opening years of the 20th century, end quote. And that's from her book, Painting Dublin, 1886 to 1949. The fish market uh, depicts a scene which would have been quite common in the area around St. Patrick's Cathedral. Osborne regularly spent time um, around the, in the streets around uh, Patrick Street, uh, sketching and observing. And here we see a number of stall and stalls and various groupings of people around them. So the work is loosely painted, but there is quite a lot of detail. In the background, we can see hats and clothing uh, at the stall to the left and meat hanging at the, uh, the one next to it. Of course, the poverty of the people is quite obvious, and the children particularly look a little uh, unkempt. Osborne was a member of the Dublin Protection Society, which wanted to protect the old buildings and the streets and to improve the slum areas. So he's very concerned with the fabric of the city, uh, perhaps more so or alongside uh, its people, uh, its poor in particular. The fish market was actually owned by Lane in 1904, and it uh, became part of the collection when the gallery first opened in 1908. This is Paul Henry's Lakeside Cottages from 1929. And of course, uh, the west of Ireland and uh, rural landscapes became hugely bound up in the whole question of uh, Irish identity, really, I suppose, from the mid 19th century, but particularly after uh, Irish independence. And Paul Henry was particularly associated with uh, paintings of the uh, Western seaboard. Paul Henry was born in Belfast. His dates are 1877 to 1958. 
He studied in Paris at the Academy Julian and the Academy Carmen, uh, which was run by Whistler. And from 1912, he lived in Ackle for seven years. And his landscapes, I suppose, became synonymous with notions of Irishness in post-independent Ireland. Uh, the cottages and the rugged landscapes of the Western seaboard all fitted with the notion of the West of Ireland representing the true Ireland untouched by the Britishness of uh, colonial occupation. And aspects of this, of course, were also to be found in Sean Keating's work. And the artists were hugely influenced by the landscape and they sketched outdoors, but uh, they painted in the studio. So they did engage with the outdoors, but the works were uh, completed indoors. Kernoff was a contemporary. He was born in 1900 and lived until 1974. He was born in London, but moved to Dublin at the age of 14. So while um, Henry was doing these uh, landscapes in the west of Ireland, Kernoff was doing uh, recordings of uh, Dublin. Against the background of the shops which line Wine Tavern Street, Kernoff depicts people going about their day. So you can see here there are two carts full of hay or straw and they're being pushed up the steep hill and you get an idea of uh, just exactly how steep the hill is uh, by the amount of effort it's taking to push these carts uh, up the hill of course there's great detail in the uh, shop frontages and you can see um t young hatter on one and uh, another shop walkers on the corner these buildings were demolished in uh, 1964. The red seat near Bagot Street Bridge is very typical of Kernoff's work from the 1930s onwards. He painted the Grand Canal a number of times and Milligan's ar Milligan argues that in works throughout the 1930s, Kernoff's images of leisure, solitude and quietness come to the fore. And I think even though this is from 1947, I think you can really see it here. The stresses of urban life really seem not to touch uh, the solitary figure seated on the red uh, seat. He seems to be reading a book and he's undisturbed even by his little dog, who seems to be quite curious about the, uh, the swan gliding on the canal. Um, the the uh, trees are in full leaf and the uh, grass on the other uh, side of the canal is very green. So we get this sense of an oasis, even though the figures on the right-hand side of the canvas are striding quite purposefully. So we do get a sense of the urban just slightly uh, away from this lovely peaceful scene. Moving back uh, to the rural, this is uh, Camille Souter's Jouse Mountain, County Wicklow, midwinter 1967. And this is oil and tempera uh, on cardboard, again from the collection at Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane. So this beautifully uh, delicate work um, is uh, really worth uh, having a look at. Camille Souter was born in Northampton in 1929, but like Kernoff, she moved to Ireland as a young child. Suter is self-taught and she has expressed her delight at the freedom of not having had formal training. Uh, she, she remarks, uh, the paintings make something of relative permanence out of fleeting experience. And as such, they do deal with things lost, moments of time no longer present but past. So Suter is very interested in the formation of landscape. She's a member of the Irish Meteorological Society, the Geograph Geological Society, and the uh, Landscape Association. So the physicality of weather and the formation of landscape is something in which she's really passionately in inter uh, interested. Um, her reference to things lost suggests the possibility of um, maybe a, a sort of a spiritual feeling about uh, some of her work. And indeed, we can get that here because of her use of tempera. And there are, if you see the painting in reality, there are little flecks of gold paint uh, in the foreground, which call to mind early Renaissance works. 
So we get a, a sense of, uh, although we get a sense of timelessness, there is also a, a, a transience about this. Uh, of course, uh, the, the mountain is covered with a blanket of snow, but that, of course, will melt and disappear. Um, and the spruce trees, the, the scattering of spruce trees, which are not native to Ireland, are, uh, you know, currently being replaced by uh, uh, more native species. This uh, lovely work is uh, the first work uh, of uh, Sucho, which went into a public collection in Ireland. Um, Basil Goulding became a collector of her work, and he uh, founded the um, Contemporary Irish Art Society with the express purpose of uh, collecting works for the Hugh Lane. And in 1976, Waiting for the Sun Come Out, became the first work by Souter to go into a public collection. Uh, she likes her works uh, to be seen uh, under natural daylight, but of course that isn't uh, always uh, possible. And so we move on uh, to the final two paintings in uh, today's talk, and these are cityscapes of uh, a different um, of a different type. Uh, this is Brian Maguire. Uh, Maguire was born in Bray, County Wicklow, in 1951. He was educated at the Dunleary School of Art and the National College of Art and Design. He saw Mein Kampf uh, when he was 12 or 13 years old, and he thinks it, it possible that his painting um, stems from that experience. He said that the image of wooden wheelbarrows filled with corpses remained with him and that nobody does anything uh, others are not capable of. So Maguire became socially and politically engaged at an early age, and he sees art as a means of critique. He said, art is never only a job, it is about changing the world's perceptions. The aesthetic is not the essential uh, ingredient. Uh, for him, uh, politics is more important than uh, art history. And he sees uh, the job of an artist is to be an individual witness. He, he does consider that that is quite liberating because uh, an artist gains access, but it's also limiting because in these difficult situations, as he says, you don't get to do much. But for him, empathy is the primary tool uh, in making art. Uh, among the reasons for uh, the number of slums in Nairobi uh, are uh, a, a move from rural to urban and uh, a rapid population growth. And 60% of the population of Nairobi live in makeshift structures in crowded slums. And here, as you can see, Maguire uses blood red like smears of paint uh, and galvanized sheets uh, at the at the top of the work uh, with you know uh, planks of wood and uh, the detritus which seems to have been uh, moved into a heap as it's being cleared uh, only of course presumably to be replaced by uh, another slum as soon as that's cleared away this is aleppo 4 from the aleppo paintings a series called War Changes Its Address, and it seemed particularly apt to finish with this one today. It, uh, the series resulted from Maguire's visit to Syria and his witnessing at first hand the destruction of a people and their city. Maguire says there is no fixed truth because it continuously shifts. So seemingly permanent urban structures can collapse in minutes. This is not part of the collection of the Hugh Lane, but it did seem particularly appropriate. And returning to uh, Manet's music in the Tuileries Garden, I'd just like to thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the talk and that you will get into the Hugh Lane very soon uh, to see many of these beautiful paintings.